Yo Atlas speaking and welcome to part 4 of what if I was reborn into the Bleach universe and became a hollow with a system. Let the tale begin. Chapter 61, New Friends I'm Hisashi the uh. Vasto Lord, he responds unsure of himself. Unlike her adult form, Nell's child form had a rather unique personality. He couldn't hate it though, it even reminded him a little of when his younger sister was still little. Hitashi? Nice to meet you, she responds happily with her lisp. No. No, please no. It's Hisashi, Hisashi. Please say it right, he said, sweating nervously. Hitashi, she responded excitedly, no change at all from the first time. She didn't even seem to be trying. Hisashi could only sigh in defeat. He knew trying to fix her pronunciation was a waste of time, but accepting how she said his name was just too embarrassing to accept. Shortly after, the other three finally caught up. Release Nelsama right now, the skinny one yelled indignantly. Give her back, the chunky one bellowed. Hisashi could see tears of desperation in his eyes. Bawa Bawa, the snake cried out. Hitashi, run! Nell yelled while giggling. The three trying to save her looked surprised. Brothers, Nelsama has been brainwashed, the skinny one said in a panic. W what? We have to save her, the chunky one said joining in on the panic. Hurry or we'll lose eternal pursuit. Nell too said continuing to ignore their panic, adamant to win her game. Hisashi wasn't even sure how they were supposed to win at eternal pursuit. The skinny one makes a sudden desperate jump for them, but Hisashi sends him flying back into a nearby dune with a simple push kick. Ah! Uh. Pesh, the chunky one yells running after Pesh who was sent flying. Bawa Bawa, the snake cried in confusion looking back and forth between the two groups. Nu! That's not how you play Eternal Pursuit. Don't bully them! Nell too cried out. Hisashi softly smacked her upside the back of her head with the side of his blade. Then tell them that, he chided her. Ouch, she said and pouted. After his warning she leaped down from his shoulder and ran to the three to warn them. Though Hisashi gave her a good feeling, she also felt that he could be very dangerous from the pressure he gave off even when suppressing his spiritual pressure. It seemed even more dangerous than some of the other errand cars she knew. Brothers! This is Hitashi. My new friend, she said happily. Hisashi. Hisashi. Hisashi yelled to make sure they understood what his name really was. One person calling him that was already enough of a disgrace. What? Are we being abandoned? Pesh said in a distraught tone. Falling to his knees as if he had given up on life. Dondo Chaka patted him on the back. You'll be okay, I'm still your brother, he said to console Pesh. Bawabawa lowered his head crying sadly. No! We're still brothers. Nell too assured them. The three of them did a full 180 as if they hadn't been depressed seconds before. The three bowed humbly. Nice to meet ya, they said in unison. So who are you all, he asked them despite being very well aware of who they were. I'm Nell too, Nell too said. You already told me that, Hisashi deadpanned. Nell too bonked herself on the head with her tiny fist while smiling derpily. I'm Peshkwatish, the skinny one said. I'm Dondo Chaka Burstin, the chunky one yelled. And united we're Dash, they started in unison. The Nell Dot Desert Thieves. Nell too completed the sentence. The Great Desert Brothers. Dondo Chaka completed the sentence. The three superpowered siblings of the Burning Sands. Pesh completed the sentence. Bawa Bawa, the snake said. All four were yelling different endings at the same time while posing like Power Rangers making it hard to understand. Are you all idiots? Hisashi asked incredulously. Idiots? Nell too asked with confusion. No, I'm a masochist, she said proudly. Hisashi sighed. Would you mind coming to see some friends of mine? Hisashi asked her. Of course. If they're your friends they must be great she said with a wide smile. 
She got back up on his back grabbing onto the hair coming from under his mask to hold onto him. Hisashi started running at a speed that Nell's fraction would be able to keep up at. Yahoo! she yelled excitedly kicking his chest like he was her steed. Her fraction was a lot less excited as they ran as fast as they could simply to keep up. They could only keep this up before they jumped on top of Bawabawa who was able to move faster and for longer. To their surprise, when Bawabawa went faster and was catching up to Hisashi and Nell too, Hisashi simply smirked and increased his speed even further. Ha 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 ha! Faster! Faster! If you go even faster Nell will explode! Nell too yelled happily. Hisashi could only deadpan remembering that child Nell had quite the potty mouth whether it was intentional or not he wasn't sure. Bawabawa could only cry silently as he did his best to keep up with their new speed. Secretly he wished the other two had never jumped on top of him so he could have kept up at the relaxed pace. It took quite a few days to get to the forest of Minos which he needed to pass through to get to Haribel's hideout. It would take a few more days to get through the forest and reach the hideout. Well look who we have here, they suddenly heard someone say shortly after exiting the forest. Suddenly a tall muscular young man with light blue spiky hair walked out from behind one of the trees. He had a partial bone mask of a sharp-toothed mouth covering the right half of his jaw and green eyeliner-like marks on the lower and outer edges of his blue eyes. He was wearing a pure white hakama and jacket combination with black accents. A sword was tied to his waist with a black sash and his hand was resting on it threateningly. Chapter 62 Frustrations Hisashi immediately went on high alert. Unexpectedly it was Grimjow Jagerjax and he had managed to become an Erenkar since their last encounter. Normally Hisashi wouldn't be too concerned, but there was no way Nell too and her fraction would be able to resist Grimjow now that he was an Erenkar too. His eyes darted between the trees in the vicinity, but to his relief no one else was showing up and he couldn't sense any other powerful spiritual signature nearby. It seemed Grimjow had become even more arrogant after turning into an Erenkar and decided to hunt him solo rather than allow his fraction join him on this hunt. He should probably be thankful for Grimjow's pride. It was dangerous enough with just him as an Erenkar. He didn't need his fraction, also turned into Erenkar, to join in on the battle. He had no delusions about being able to avoid a battle here. Grimjow's pride would never let him walk away with how he had stomped on their prides last time around. They were quite close to the hideout already. He wasn't sure how, but Grimjow had managed to catch his trail at some point. How have you been? It's been a while after all, Grimjow said venomously. Hisashi whispered the directions towards the hideout to Nell too while Grimjow slowly stalked closer to them like a panther stalking its prey. When you find an opportunity or I tell you, run there as fast as you can, he whispered to her. You've made me run all over the place looking for you, Grimjow said. Nell too looked like she was on the verge of tears. Not only was Grimjow putting out a lot of spiritual pressure, but it was absolutely died in his killing intent. Every hollow had an acute sense for killing intent growing up in Hueco Mundo surrounded by those wishing to consume you to survive and grow. The other three were in an even worse state, cowering in fear. Before Grimjow could take action Hisashi grabbed Nell too by the scruff of her neck and tossed her to her fraction. Thankfully though she looked like a preteen girl even as a damaged Erenkar she was still quite resistant. Ho! Grimjow said looking between Hisashi and Nell too's group. Suddenly he rushed after Nell too faster than they could respond with a wide grin. Hisashi dashed to intercept him crossing his blades to block a punch he sent her way. His blades were shaking from the pressure Grimjow was applying. Finally! This is what I've been waiting for. I'm going to crush you! Grimjow yelled excitedly. Get out of here! Hisashi yelled at Nell too. They are weak and they make you weak. Grimjow yelled and laughed almost maniacally while sending a flurry of punches his way, all of which he managed block. Though Grimjow had gotten much faster than he used to be, speed was Hisashi's strongest aspect after all. The strength was where he was running into concerns though. It seemed they were quite closely matched in it now with him only being a bit stronger. So far Hisashi still held the upper hand, but Grimjow was so arrogant he hadn't even unsheathed his Zampakudo yet let alone unleash his resurrection. 
both of which would at least even the stakes and possibly even allow Grimjow to exceed him. Nell too and her fraction quickly recovered from their stupor. They jumped on Bawabawa and Nell too started giving it directions that it quickly followed dashing away from the fight while Hisashi held back Grimjow. He couldn't run this time as he was sure if he did Grimjow would go after Nell too in an attempt to force his hand again. Thankfully due to his personality Grimjow wasn't too interested in weaklings and was also far more concerned with gaining back his pride by defeating Hisashi leading to him to ignore them now that he was in the battle he desired. After a few failed clashes Grimjow jumped back. You're stronger than I expected, he said while slowly unsheathing his Zampakudo. Immediately he dashed back towards Hisashi. Unfortunately for him, between the two of them Hisashi actually had much more experience in the use of blades with Grimjow still learning how to handle his Zampakudo. They clashed a few times repelling each other into the nearby trees of the forest of Minos. Their impacts were powerful enough to cause them to explode and fall upon impact. By that time they had already propelled themselves back at each other for the next clash though. The ringing of blades resounding far through the forest. No other hollow dared to approach though between the loud sounds of battle, destruction, and the terrifyingly scare levels of spiritual pressure their clash was giving off. After countless clashes and Grimjow's increasing frustration at his lack of zenjutsu, swordsmanship, skills when he landed on one of the trees he charged a red-tinted siro in his hand. Hisashi immediately stretched his four blades in front of him with the tips pointing at each other. In front of each of them a reddish-black sphere formed until the four merged into a bigger sphere swirling with the same colors. Hisashi ended up firing his own Siro moment after Grimjow had. The two Siro clashed in the middle. It resulted in a loud explosion that ended up pushing both of them back while uprooting the trees in range. The only thing left afterwards was a big circular crater devoid of forest. Seeing he had failed again Grimjow aggressively rubbed his hair in frustration while glaring at Hisashi before breaking out into a cackle. Impossible, I'm the king and you aren't even an Arankar, he growled out. He breathed in deeply trying to calm himself down some. I can't believe you forced me to this point, but I'll make sure you pay, he said. Grimjow held his Zampakudo horizontal while placing his fingers on it like a claw. The Zampakudo started glowing. Spirit power started swirling around him violently. Grind! Pantera! Grimjow yelled out drawing his claw across the side of the blade. The gathered spiritual power exploded in all directions. Chapter 63, Tied Up When the disturbance died down it revealed Grimjow's resurrection form. His hands and feet hard turned into black claws. His mask had spread across his entire body with the exception of some of his chest and face like some kind of armor. He had blades on his forearms and calves. He regained his panther tail and ears. His hair had also grown long almost reaching the ground, almost like a second tail. Grimjow crouched down low like a beast stalking its prey, his muscles taut. Unsure how much Grimjow's resurrection would boost his power Hisashi didn't hold back. Faded blue vein-like patterns were starting to spread across his body when he started using blood vene to massively increase the resistance of his skin in preparation of what was surely to come. He immediately used his illusory aura to cover up the changes before they became brighter and more obvious though. He had barely managed to complete the spread of blood vene, but Grimjow had already disappeared from his spot launching himself at Hisashi much faster than he had before. Hisashi was barely able to keep up with Grimjow's new speed. Since he hadn't had a chance to adjust to the new speed a loud screech and sparks occurred when Grimjow's claws left deep gouges across his chest despite blood vene. Multiple trees around them were split like butter by Grimjow's claws sending them flying. Hisashi used the impact from Grimjow's attack to launch himself away from Grimjow and give him some breathing room. The gouges on his chest already healed, but this was the first time Grimjow managed to injure him at all. Grimjow didn't let up though and immediately dashed after him spinning around and sending a kick his way that he barely managed to block with two of his blades. Hisashi wasn't quite sure why, but he felt some kind of desperation from Grimjow's attacks that hadn't been there before. It made him wonder why. Since Grimjow was currently much stronger than before, then shouldn't he be more confident than ever? 
Grimjow used his resistance to propel his spin in the other direction following up with a slash with his arm that, despite being blocked, sent Hisashi careening through the forest smashing tree after tree before he finally managed to come to a stop. Grimjow was close on his heels though. Grimjow's claw stretching towards him in an attempt to stab him. Take that! Grimjow yelled. Hisashi leaned back just in time to avoid the claw from piercing his head, but it still managed to cut off one of his arms sending it flying with a burst of blood. He did a backflip and caught his detached arm placing it against the bleeding stump. His healing factor immediately took over reattaching the arm. He flexed it a bit to test it, making sure he could still use it. Why are you in such a hurry? Hisashi asked Grimjow out of curiosity. He noticed Grimjow hesitated as soon as he called him out. He was becoming more sure there was a reason Grimjow seemed to be rushing the fight when his personality definitely made him the type to save her taking down his prey slowly one bite at a time. The way he was acting was out of character. TCH Grimjow spat out, but rather than refute Hisashi he pushed himself even harder and threw a flurry of attacks at Hisashi that took all his effort to simply block the fatal attacks. He had to let the non-fatal attacks through though and simply rely on his regeneration to take care of the wounds they left. Hisashi's breathing was growing more labored as he strained himself to keep up with Grimjow's resurrection. The blood vene patterns on his skin were slowly starting to flicker as they struggled to handle all of Grimjow's attacks. Hisashi charged another Siro, but allowed the blood from his wounds to drip down his blades and into the Siro. Given Grimjow's lack of reaction he hadn't learned about this technique yet. When the blood reached the gathering energy it sped up the formation and increased the power many times over while dying at purple. This allowed Hisashi to immediately fire off a Grand Ray Siro that sent Grimjow flying back miles through the forest eventually leaving a deep trench in the ground when he hit it ending his short lives flight. For the first time in this battle Grimjow was hurt and it took him a few moments to recover. He slowly stood up from the trench giving Hisashi a look that could kill. Unlike Hisashi who had a stronger regenerative factor than even your regular Ajuchas, Grimjow like most Arankar had given up on his regeneration in favor of more power which was showing some of its drawbacks now. Despite seeming to need it, Grimjow didn't give himself more time to recover. Instead he threw himself right back into the fight by dashing towards Hisashi at his highest speed. Grimjow leapt on him like a cat sending his clawed hands and feet at him in an attempt to cut him up, but Hisashi blocked each limb of his with one of his bladed arms each. Before Grimjow was able to make a follow-up move Hisashi used a front kick to send Grimjow flying backwards. Hisashi's blades started shimmering with blade energy that he sent flying Grimjow's way in an inescapable criss-cross pattern. It seemed Grimjow's armor was tougher than he had expected though. Unlike his expectations he hadn't managed to dismember him and only caused some deep bleeding cuts to form. He was growing worried about whether he would be able to outlast Grimjow. His recovery might be superior, but he didn't have unlimited energy and he very well might run out before Grimjow. The only thing that brought him any relief was that Grimjow didn't look any better covered in wounds and panting in exhaustion as well. He could only hope he would be able to occupy Grimjow long enough for Nell too and the others to make it to Haribel and the Trace Bestias. Even if Grimjow managed to win, he would be in no shape to fight Haribel anymore. Chapter 64 Desperation As the battle progressed Grimjow's already wild combat style only seemed to grow wilder and wilder. Though this made the battle more frantic it actually became a little easier to keep up since it made him more predictable. His default action had become to attack after all. Even feints were becoming infrequent which made Hisashi question what was making Grimjow so determined to take him out as quickly as possible. Their clashes had flattened most of the surrounding forest they passed through and though Grimjow didn't seem to have learned his special claw attack yet they were plenty dangerous already. The only part of him strong enough to resist them was his blades as they sliced through anything else they came in contact with. Ha ha ha. Yes. More! Grimjow laughed and yelled in excitement his breathing growing haggard. Hisashi kept doing his best to block what he could and get some counter strikes in where he could, but he was still getting pushed back by Grimjow's relentless onslaught. It was like Grimjow couldn't even tell he was getting equally cut up in his fervor. 
Eventually Grimjow took inspiration from Isashi, cutting his palm and infusing his blood into his siro to form his own Grand Ray siro like Hisashi had. The forming siro looked unstable stretching and shifting. It appeared like it could blow up any moment, but either due to his ridiculous talent or plot armor Grimjow actually managed to form and maintain the Grand Ray siro despite it being his first attempt and fired it successfully. Grimjow smiled victoriously. Between switching to Grand Ray Ciro and unleashing his Resurrection, the power of his Ciro was completely unlike before. Hisashi did his best to form one of his own to counter. When they came to a violent clash in the middle, Hisashi managed to hold on for a few moments, but eventually Grimjow's Grand Ray Ciro seemed to win out. It slowly started forcing back Hisashi's closer and closer. When the two clashing Ciro reached Hisashi it slowly started disintegrating his blades and arms while continuing to try resisting the blast with what was left of his own and by pumping all leftover energy he could into blood vene. He did manage to slow down Grimjow's Grand Ray Ciro, but the crazy amounts of heat it was giving off at such a close range was evaporating his arms regardless. The Ciro worked its way through his blades and arms until they were gone completely, but Hisashi had succeeded in countering most of the energy it contained. After negating his Ciro and evaporating his four arms it didn't have enough strength left to do the same to his torso. At the current rate Hisashi had only managed to delay the inevitable. Grimhelm might have expanded most of his energy creating the attack, but Hisashi had done the same to block it and was now down four arms. They had already started to heal, but it would still take a while before that made any useful progress. Ignoring the amount of pain that would continue distracting him until they had recovered. Hitashi. He heard a young girl's voice yell desperately. Both him and Grimjow immediately turned towards the yell with entirely different emotions. Hisashi was finally relieved. It seemed Nell 2 had indeed found the hideout and brought all of them to help him. Nell 2's face was a mess with tears, snot, and drool staining it. Hitashi. Please help him. Nell 2 cried out in desperation. Panting heavily, Grimjow's eyes darted between the newcomers and Hisashi, his rapidly healing arms and specific, nervously. As soon as Haribel saw what was going on she dashed ahead of the group reaching beside Hisashi to support him. You look like you could use a hand, she said. Had it been anyone else he would have taken that as a dig at his current state. She seemed calm on the surface, but Hisashi could tell the underlying worry in her tone. Grimjow looked between the two of them hesitantly. He seemed rather frustrated to have the fight he had been searching for for so long interrupted. Like someone put the most delicious plate of food in front of a starving man and right as he is about to dig in taking it away again. He could sense he wouldn't be able to beat Hisashi if Haribel joined the fight though from the levels of spirit pressure she was giving off. It was already a pretty even fight before she got there after all and now he saw no way for him to succeed on his own let alone if the other seven also decided to join in. I didn't know you were such a coward. Grimjow tried to taunt Hisashi. Unfortunately for Grimjow, Hisashi wasn't some kind of shonen protagonist. He cared about his own life, he also had friends he needed to protect and family to eventually return to. Dying was not something he would risk for a thrill of a battle, his pride, or something else insane like that. If someone was on or beyond his level he would happily gang up on them instead if it meant he and those with him could survive another day. Hisashi could only shake his head at Grimjow's naivety, pissing him off even more in the process. On some level he seemed to sense that Hisashi had disdained him. Seeing his attempts weren't succeeding Grimjow crouched and disappeared into the distance. Hisashi could chase him, but the rest wouldn't be able to keep up which would just put him into the same situation the two of them had been in before. All he could do is continue building his strength so hopefully next time he would be able to stand up against Grimjow all by himself. At least now that Grimjow had already become an Arankar he shouldn't see any sudden jumps in power from him, unless something unexpected happened at least. Nell too ran up launching herself into Hisashi like a cannonball. He would complain about the tears, drool, and snot being wiped on him, but he didn't have the heart. Chapter 65 Coming Together Hitashi. I was so worried. Nell too cried. Hisashi wrapped his still healing arms around her the best he could while avoiding cutting her with his blades and rubbed the top of her head with his cheek. 
There, there. See I'm doing just fine, he said trying to comfort her. Be but. She stuttered looking at his arms. He smiled lightly showing her one of the arms to reveal it was still healing itself at a rapid pace causing it to reform from nothing. It wouldn't take him much longer before he was fully healed. Finally seeing he was probably going to make it she sighed in relief the worst of her panic subsiding and some hope returning to her gaze. See. It'll be all better before you know it, he reassured her. She nodded and hugged him even tighter. When Hisashi looked up he actually saw Haribel looking at the two of them tenderly, which surprised him. She usually kept her expression very neutral and reading any of her emotions required paying close attention to minor changes in her expression and tone to even get a slight clue. He looked down to Nell too who was still making a mess of his chest. Thank you for saving me though, he told Nell too with a warm smile. After wiping away the various liquids from her face she eagerly climbed up on his shoulder again and patted his shoulder. Of cause, Hitashi is a big brother too. I was so worried, she said. Wouldn't you rather spend time with a big sister? Apache tried to tempt Nell too. Unlike her expectation Nell too simply crossed her arms and shook her head. I'm sure Isashi would like to spend some time with this big sister, Sun Sun teased Apache. Screw him, she retorted. Language missy. Hisashi joked. Sun Sun chuckled. Mila Rose just shook her head at them. Surprisingly Haribel actually came up to them out of her own initiative. I know we didn't have a chance before, but are you doing okay? She asked Nell too worriedly. I'm okay now, Nell too said with a proud smile. Hisashi almost pouted. Who was the one being attacked just moments ago here? Haribel raised her brow at him and he could almost swear she smirked under her mask. And you? she asked him. I'm doing fine, thank you very much. Nice of you to ask, he retorted. She actually chuckled for a moment before schooling her expression. Pesh and Dondo Chaka were rather nervous. Though they could handle Apache, Sung Sun and Mila Rose, Haribel and Hisashi were both well beyond them. Though they had grown to trust Hisashi somewhat over the time they spent traveling with him they were still more cautious than Nell too who had taken to him like water. Now that they were surrounded by so many others their cowardly nature was in full force. Nell Sama, they shouted in chorus rushing to her. It's fine. Big Brother is here with us, she reassured them while looking at Hisashi with a confident smile. Hisashi couldn't help but smile back at her confidence in him. We should head to the hideout just to be safe, Haribel insisted. Hisashi and Nell too agreed and it didn't take long for everyone to get back to the hideout. When they got to the hideout Hisashi decided to play some games with Nell too to help her calm down after everything that happened. They played some tag and eventually switched to board games like he had done with the Trace Bestias a previous time. Nell too ended up playing a game against Apache. I win! Nell too yelled proudly. What? Impossible! Apache yelled unwilling to accept her loss to a child. Nell too crossed her arms over her chest looking down on Apache frustrating her even further. You can call me Big Sis, she said. Get over here! Apache yelled angrily as she rushed towards Nell too. Nell too quickly hid behind Hisashi and immediately climbed up his back and onto his shoulder. Apache couldn't even beat you. Nell too is truly amazing, Hisashi joked. Nell too actually stuck out her tongue at Apache and pulling down her lower eyelid to taunt her. Apache stomped her hoof in frustration wanting to drag Nell too down from Hisashi's shoulder, but there was nothing she could do. Defeated by a little girl. Poor Apache, Sun Sun said as if she was empathizing with Apache, but truly she was just egging her on more. You have to be the bigger person Apache. You two stop making things worse though, Haribel scolded Apache, Sun Sun and Hisashi while defending Nell too. Why yes Haribel Sama, Apache said in a defeated tone. She could argue with Sun Sun and Hisashi, but not Haribel. Sun Sun nodded in agreement. Hisashi just shook his head in amusement though at Haribel's double standard for Nell too. Let's play, Haribel told Nell too who became excited again jumping down from Hisashi's shoulder to join her. 
Yes, big sister, she said happily dragging her to the games they made explaining the rules to Harabel, who listened attentively despite already knowing them. She was already there when they were explained to Nell to herself after all, but she didn't mind humoring the girl. Hisashi joined them two playing together, sometimes helping Nell too to even the balance while sometimes helping Harabel or simply cheering from the sidelines when necessary. As the games continued Nell too slowly forgot about the precarious situation they had just been through distracted by the fun, games, and new friends instead. The surprising part was seeing Harabel open up more than she ever had before. Not only to Nell too, but also towards Hisashi who despite all the time and effort they had spent together had made less progress in getting closer to Harabel over the months he knew her than in one evening spent with both her and Nell too. It was a little depressing, but he was just happy that their relationship was improving like he already had with the rest of the Trace Bestias. Even Apache who constantly argued with him was more like a rebellious little sister and had been closer with him despite the arguments than Harabel had been. Last Christmas Part 1 Christmas many years ago. Twas the night before Christmas and all through the house was the smell of Kentucky fried chicken brought home by a spouse. The Saito family was seated at the dining table, decked out in warm colorful winter sweaters. Little Raina was drooling over the huge bucket of KFC fried chicken, mashed potatoes, gravy and biscuits their father, Saito Atsuhiro, had brought home with him. Their mom Yuzuki had coaxed them in decorating the house and dining table with her in Christmas cheer, there was even a small Christmas tree in the corner decorated with lights, garland, ornaments, and a star on top. Odo-san see can we start? Reina asked impatiently. Their father smiled. Go ahead, he said. Their mother started serving up the food filling all their plates except Reina who got just a little bit of everything. Reina looked at everyone else's full plates. I want more too, she whined with a pout. Their mom chuckled lightly. Eat that first and if you finish it I'll give you more, she said. Reina's serious pout slowly melted. Do you promise? she asked seriously. Their mom nodded. Of course, she said. It didn't take long before Reina's smile returned. Yay, she cheered grabbing onto one of the drumsticks. She started gnawing at it like her life depended on it. Hisashi smiled watching his little sister go. Don't go too fast, there's cake for dessert too. If you eat too much and are sick tomorrow then all the presents will be mine mwahaha he said theatrically. Her eyes went wide with the drumstick still in her mouth. No way Hisashi Onayakin. Those are mine, she said warily. It was hard to make out with the drumstick muffling it though. Don't talk with your mouth full, their mother warned. Reina looked away nervously. She ended up nibbling on the drumstick until there wasn't a shred of meat left on it. Hisashi served some mashed potatoes and gravy on her plate. Reina grimaced. Boo, I want more chicken, she said. Hisashi smirked. If I fill you up on mashed potatoes there will be more cake left for me, he teased. She seemed appalled at the mere idea. Nah. Cake goes in the desert stomach she said indignantly. He smiled back. We'll see about that, he said. Their father had loosened his tie and was nursing a beard that went well with the fried chicken. All right, you two, don't make a mess, he said. He looked over at Hisashi. How are things going at college, he asked. Hisashi looked at him thoughtfully for a moment. They are going well, father. The programming electives I chose are really paying off, he said. Are you sure? I still think studying business would have been better, his father responded. Although his father had allowed him to pursue a degree mathematics degree with multiple computer science electives, the field was still brand new leading to him questioning Hisashi about his choice of career quite frequently. Hisashi knew it came from a good place. Hisashi smiled softly. You don't have to worry, father. Give it a few years and this will be the biggest thing, he said confidently. His father smiled back and decided to give up on trying to change his son's mind. He knew his son was brilliant and thought he could achieve great things if he got a solid business degree and joined a reliable company, possibly even the company he himself worked for. His usually filial son had always been stubborn about this one thing though so he relented. 
their mother just rolled her eyes at the two of them. More importantly, tell me have you met any girls yet? She asked. She shot him a light glare. You are planning to make me an old grandma or worse are you? She asked before he could even answer. Hisashi coughed awkwardly. Mother, you know how it is. None of the girls in school see me as boyfriend material since I'm four years younger than them and I don't meet girls outside of school, he said. She sighed in response. I knew I shouldn't have agreed to them letting you skip those classes. What about that girl in your kendo class? She asked. He grimaced in response. There was a girl in his kendo class that was a year younger that seemed very interested in him. They had known each other for a few years now. Unfortunately, he wasn't really into 15-year-olds. She was a nice enough girl and they could be considered more than just acquaintances, but she was still far too immature. Who knows, if she persisted for a few more years and matured things could change. However, as things were he just saw her as the little girl she was. He sighed. And maybe in the future, he said. She looked over at Reina, putting her hand on her head. I'll just have to rely on you in the future, little Reina Chan, she said with a theatrically dramatic sigh. Reina seemed confused as she couldn't understand what they were talking about, but decided to just smile along for their mother's sake. Now it was Hisashi's turn to roll his eyes. Just give it a few years, mother, he said. The one thing that excited her more than the fried chicken was the cake they had for dessert. Once she had finished her slice, though she was so full she could have gone straight to sleep. Reina finished the cake with a few chocolate smudges on her cheeks. Hisashi took a napkin and cleaned up the worst of it. Ah, Nu, she shouted dramatically trying to escape his hands. Hisashi was undeterred though and on a mission to make sure she was clean. After they cleaned up the table Hisashi lifted her up carrying her to the couch. He put on a Christmas movie and curled up together under a blanket on the couch. Reina didn't even make it to the end of the movie before she ended up nodding off, her head dropped against his arm. When the movie ended he was careful not to wake her up while he carried her to her bedroom and tucked her in. He was sure she would be up early for presents the next day. He helped his parents clean up some more before heading to bed himself a little later. Last Christmas Part 2 The next morning Hisashi woke up with someone crawling on top of him in bed. Hisashi Onayakin Get up! Get up! Reina chanted. Suddenly a foot accidentally slipped stomping him in the gut causing him to groan. He was wide awake now. Okay. Okay, I'm up, he moaned. Reina smiled brightly as he crawled out of bed before dragging him to the living room. Below their miniature Christmas tree were a bunch of presents. Their parents were already waiting and watching them with a smile. Reina couldn't hold back and dove under the tree searching for a gift meant for her. It didn't take her long to find one. She didn't hesitate to rip the paper off revealing a magical girl staff from her favorite TV show. Her eyes were glimmering in excitement as she unboxed it and swung it around. Hisashi smiled watching her enjoy the Christmas gift he got her. He expected she would like it, but seeing how much she liked it really made it worth it. Their mother looked on with a smile from the couch. Why don't you check some of the other boxes? She asked. Reina looked toward her eyes darting between the magic staff and the remaining gifts. Okay, she eventually begrudgingly agreed. Their mom pointed at a particularly large box. Reina grabbed it and tore off the ribbon and wrapping paper. This was actually a matching present their parents bought to go with the magic staff Hisashi bought her as a present. When she opened the box, a beautiful frilly knee-high white and red dress with ribbons was revealed. Reina squealed in excitement. Can I try it on now? She asked excitedly. Of course, sweetheart. Do you need a hand? Their mom said. She nodded seriously. Their mom took her to change and when she came back Reina had become the cutest little magical girl. She had even done her hair up in twin pigtails. Reina grabbed the wand and started twirling it as she pranced around the living room. She struck a pose with her free hand held up to her face with the peace sign. Magical girl Reina is here, she announced proudly. Hisashi chuckled. How dare you laugh? Evil villain, she shouted. Hisashi stood up with his arms spread with the palms facing up and his legs spread. 
Mwahaha, your powers are a mere joke before me Lord Evil, he responded theatrically. No, not Lord Evil, she responded in exaggerated shock. She took a fighting pose. You won't succeed. Not on my watch. Prepare for defeat, she said. Not this time. After I defeat you I'll rule this world, he retorted taking on a fighting pose of his own. He quickly ran to his gym bag and grabbed one of his botkin used for kata in his kendo classes and pointed it at Reina. Never! You will bow before me soon enough, he said. She smiled widely wielding her staff at him. He dove behind the couch as if she had fired a beam at him and barely dodged it. Take that, she shouted with a giggle. They continued around the room exchanging attacks and even crossing weapons when they got close enough to each other. Eventually Hisashi feigned weakness and let Reina get a hit in. He collapsed in defeat. Nuu! I'll get you next time magical girl Reina, he shouted dramatically. Reina giggled excitedly while doing some kind of little victory dance that ended in a magical girl-like pose. Their mother looked at Hisashi with a warm smile. Hey! Don't forget to open you presents, she berated him gently. Hisashi nodded and smiled back before looking at Reina. How about you find me a good-looking gift to open, he asked her. She dove back under the tree and actually brought back two presents. She handed them to him impatiently. Open them, quickly, she said. He smiled and ripped off the wrapping paper revealing a new graphics card. He looked up at his parents in surprise. He had mentioned he needed to upgrade his system offhandedly, but never expected them to help him with it. His father gave him an encouraging smile and nod. When he tore open the other one it was a better hard drive than the one he had. It was one of the new 3.5-inch models with a whopping 20 megabytes of storage. Hard drives were still rather uncommon among personal computers, but Hisashi knew they were the future and his operating system would need to be able to handle them. He smiled at his parents and nodded as an indication of his gratitude without spoiling Christmas for his sister. Reina's interest in his presence faded quickly when she noticed none of what her brother got were toys or games. She quickly dove back under the tree again to find more of her own presents instead. By the time they finally finished unwrapping the presents and playing together it was already time for lunch which was mostly leftovers. Chicken and gravy sandwiches with a slice of cake on the side. At least it was an easy meal for their mom to make and everyone loved them. Later that afternoon Hisashi was excited to finally get to work and install the new hardware in his rig. By the evening everything was ready to be tested. He was working on his upgraded computer running diagnostics and tweaking his code to fix bugs and take advantage of the new hardware. His mother opened the door to his bedroom and stood in the door opening watch him work with a soft smile. He was so distracted she wasn't even noticed. After a few moments she looked at him sternly. Don't stay up too late, we're all going to the shrine early tomorrow morning to offer a prayer, she warned. He looked up in surprise. Yes, mother, he responded. Unfortunately, as usual, he got lost in his work, which meant he did not get to bed on time. That was a concern for future him, though. Last Christmas Part 3 Hisashi's mom woke him up early. He was still groggy from staying up late. It was the new year and today was time for Hatsumode, the first shrine visit of the year. His mom wrapped a thick scarf around Reina's neck before putting a thick winter coat over it that covered most of her body, some warm gloves, and to top it off a warm woolly hat to keep her head warm. Can't we play instead? Reina asked innocently. Yuzuki patted her on the head with a gentle smile. No, we have to go offer our prayers, she said. Okay, Reina mumbled. Hisashi smiled. Come on. It'll be fun, he said, trying to cheer her up. Since it was New Year's their father was off of work for once too so they could all go together. They were going to the Meiji Shrine to celebrate Hatsumode. Hisashi watched Reina cling on to their mother on their train ride to the shrine, doing her best not to fall as the train swayed. Haryuku Station, the train speakers announced. Finally after over an hour of traveling they were there. They all shuffled out of the train and station. It was already crowded in the station and didn't get any better once they got out. The large tori greeted them at the entrance to the shrine grounds. 
Usually this place would be rather calming, but due to Hatsumo there was a large crowd slowing them down as they. They shuffled their way through the nature trail leading to the shrine. Despite nervously holding onto his and their mom's hand tightly Reina was excited by all the birds she could hear coming from the trees surrounding them. Since it took almost an hour to shuffle their way all the way to the shrine Reina eventually got tired hitching a ride sitting on Hisashi's shoulders instead as she gazed around while he struggled. They passed a wall of colorful barrels. Reina pointed at them excitedly. What are those? she asked out of curiosity. Atsuhiro smiled. Those are drinks for the gods, he said. Oh, can I try it? she asked. The three of them chuckled. No, those aren't meant for you. Even if they weren't for the gods though you're much too young, Yuzuki said. Reina crossed her arms pouting, but sitting on Hisashi's shoulders meant this almost caused her to lose balance. She quickly wrapped her arms around his head to prevent herself from falling. Their father was enjoying a nice warm tea their mother had prepared for them in a thermos. Eventually they made it to the shrine entrance which was decorated with paper lanterns. Hisashi let Reina down from his shoulders. Before they could go in they went to water fountain to purify themselves. Hisashi lifted Reina in one arm and grabbed the wooden ladle in the other. Okay, hold out your hands, he told her. Reina nodded obediently. Yes, Hisashi Nizan, she said. She stretched her little arms over the water fountain. Using the ladle he scooped the water over her hands so she could wash them. Don't forget your mouth, Hisashi warned. She hurriedly washed her mouth too. He smiled then let her down so he could do his own hands. They went over to the stalls for the Amakuji to read their fortune for the year. After a small offering Hisashi helped Reina hold the wooden shaker box so she could shake it. Eventually they tilted it to let one of the sticks escape and he read the number for her. Once he had gotten his own number in the same way they went to collect the associated fortune slips. Unfortunately for Hisashi the fortune he drew contained a somewhat ominous poem. He just shrugged it off though. It was all just a matter of hard work after all. Superstition wasn't going to help him along the way. Reina pulled on his sleeve. What did you get Hisashi Nizan? she asked. He smiled back at her. Oh it said I was going to be in big trouble, he said. Reina looked worried. He rubbed her head. Don't worry. Has your big brother ever been in big trouble? he asked. She shook her head, her smile returning. She quickly ran off to check what their parents had received, leading him to chase after her. Since the fortune was bad he tied his fortune slip to one of the strings hung around the trees nearby and headed over to the entrance. Before entering their parents and Isashi bowed towards the gate offering their respect. After noticing them bowing Reina quickly imitated them and bowed too. Hisashi chuckled at her awkwardness causing her to pout a little which just made it worse due to how cute it was. When they made it to the front of the line at the main shrine their father handed them each a five yen coin. Reina followed after Hisashi imitating him as he tossed the five yen into the offering box, bowed twice, clapped twice, offered their prayer, and finally bowed one last time. While they were offering their prayer Reina kept opening her eyes to peek around, still too young to quite understand the meaning behind what they were doing. Having completed their first prayer of the year they dropped off last year's amulets before getting new ones for the upcoming year. His parents got him a pretty blue amulet meant to help within his studies since he still had two years of college to go. Although his mom seemed to be staring at the ones meant to help with someone's love life a bit too much for his liking. Meanwhile Reina received a yellow one meant for general good fortune. Yuzuki clapped her hands together in excitement. Okay, let's go to Omoda Sando Street. We can grab some lunch there, she said. Reina who had been quite subdued until now grew much more excited knowing that Omoda Sando Street was filled with stalls selling tasty snacks, drinks, and candy. Some even sold little toys. This was much more exciting than the boring old shrine had been for her. She immediately started pulling on her family's sleeves trying to get them to hurry. Yay, she cheered loudly throwing her hands up in the air. She gave Yuzuki a big hug. When they left the main shrine they turned to the gate for one last bow and headed back towards the entrance. At least getting out of the shrine was a lot easier than getting in.
Last Christmas Part 4 Hisashi ended up having to carry Reina again. Short legs were really a problem, but she didn't mind if she got to ride on her big brother like she was some kind of giant. Their parents were holding each other's hands watching the two of them with warm smiles. They came across a bunch of stalls lining the way selling all kinds of street foods and drinks being prepared on the spot for all the people coming to the Meiji Shrine for Hatsumode. It didn't take long for Reina to see something that got her interest, pulling Hisashi's hair as if to steer him towards her target like he was her steed. Her heels were digging into his chest. Go there, she screamed excitedly. Hisashi sighed, but complied. Okay, okay. I'm going. Calm down, he said. It ended up being a stall that had a variety of candied fruit. There was a slightly chubby man at the stall. What would you like, young lady? he asked. Reina got too shy to say anything so she just pointed towards the things she would like. The man gave her a kind smile packing up the things she pointed at. Was that everything you wanted? he asked her. She nodded shyly. Hisashi smiled at the kind man and handed him the money. Thank you, he said before joining their parents again. They had gone and grabbed some hot drinks for them to share and warm up in the cold weather. He grabbed one of the candied fruits from the box handing it up to Reina who happily accepted it. At one of the stalls an elderly man was brushing yakitori, grilled chicken skewers, with teriyaki sauce while turning them over. They smelled so good it didn't take him long to decide what he wanted for a snack. The yakitori was juicy and had a nice char from the charcoal grill. The smoky meaty dish hit just right on his empty stomach. It was nice to finally get some warm food and drinks in their belly after being on the move most of the morning. They walked over to a takoyaki, octopus meatballs, stall. The man behind the counter used chopsticks to constantly flip the takoyaki that were cooking on the dimpled takoyaki hot plate with practice precision. When Hisashi placed his order the guy flicked the takoyaki out of the pan and into a container like a pro. It was rather impressive how dexterous the guy was. Reina had an entirely different strategy as she kept going for all the different kinds of sweets, candies and desserts she could get. Hisashi shared a few bites of his food with her to make sure she wasn't only eating sweets, because if given the chance she totally would. She couldn't get enough of the candied strawberries that ended up being her favorite. Her chin was red and sticky with the juices, but that couldn't stop her enjoyment. Hisashi was just worried about it dripping on top of his head so he quickly helped her wipe it off. She giggled trying to avoid his hands. A young lady wearing an old-fashioned black and white maid outfit that came down to her calves was watching Reina have fun with a soft bittersweet smile. She had sleek black hair put up in a tall bun was watching Reina having fun with a soft smile. A pale young man with white hair and glasses wearing a tan suit turned to look back at her. What is it? Aren't you coming, Kane? he said. It was hard to tell whether he was upset with how even he was. She shook her head and smiled back at him. It's nothing, young master, she said. He was already walking off, too busy to enjoy the afternoon and celebrate the way the Saito family was. She quickly chased after him. They walked around exploring the stalls and stores along Omoda Sando Street only heading back to Harayuku Station once it started getting late. When they got home it was already time for dinner. Yuzuki brought out a large layered sleek black lacquer box. She had been preparing Oschi Ryari the last few days. When she unstacked the tears each was revealed to be filled with a huge selection of dishes to convey their wishes for the new year. It was absolutely stuffed with food. All four of them were excited to dig in. The main dish was the nishim, which is a chicken and root vegetable stew. Reina went straight for the candied chestnuts and sweet potatoes instead though. It seemed despite all the candy she ate during the day her sweet tooth was still not sated. Yuzuki put some of the salmon kombu rolls on Hisashi's plate with a warm smile. Here, I know how much you love these, she said. Hisashi had always enjoyed the salmon kombu rolls. The combination of salty, savory, and umami was the best. Hisashi nodded with a smile. Thanks, mother, he said. You have to make sure you eat enough, she said. He grabbed some of the yellowtail teriyaki himself, which had also turned out great. He was more of a sucker for the savory flavors. 
their father was savoring the herring roe that neither of the kids were big fans of. To each their own. Meanwhile Yuzuki was nibbling on sweet black soybeans. They looked more like shiny black pearls than beans. As a light desert there was enough machi stuffed with red bean paste for all of them. After their meal they relaxed over some nice tea while Reina started playing with her toys and stuffed animals, but it didn't last long. By the time they finished their tea it was already late and Reina had fallen asleep on the couch, exhausted by the long and exciting day. Hisashi picked her up taking her upstairs to her bedroom. He placed the already sleeping Reina in her bed tucking her in for good measure a small smile as he watched the cute little gremlin. She could really be cute and when nothing was distracting from it it became all the more obvious. Like when she was quiet and sleeping. Not that she couldn't be cute when awake. Hisashi and I, I, she mumbled in her sleep. He gently rubbed her head making sure not to wake her up. Chapter 66, Revelations Nell 2 tapped Hisashi's cheek. What is it Nell 2? he asked her. She hesitated for a moment. Are you sure you'll be okay? she asked with concern. Hisashi smiled at her. I'm really okay. You don't have to worry, he said. Haribel looked at her warmly. We're all here now so even if he comes back with his allies we will be okay. Haribel tried to reassure her. Nell too and her fraction didn't seem too convinced though. But he is an Arankar, Nell too said nervously. Arankar? Haribel asked. Pesh and Dondo Chaka were even more nervous. Unlike Nell too they still remembered their time in Las Noches. They shared a look between one another. So some changes happened in Las Noches. Berrigan isn't the leader anymore, Pesh said. Haribel looked shocked by the news. Who killed him? she asked urgently. No one. Berrigan is still alive, Pesh explained. Impossible, Haribel said in disbelief. Dondo Chaka shook his head. No, he was defeated. A Shinigami actually sits on the throne of Las Noches now, Pesh said. This got the attention of the Trace Bestias as well. No way, the usually silent Mila Rose said. Yes, his name is Aizen. He brought a new way for Hollow to grow in power. By pulling off their mask they can become an Arankar. This not only increases their power it also gives them more control over their emotions and power increasing their combat power even further. The three of us are Arankar, that's why Nell too looks so human. Pesh said. Hisashi could practically see the glimmer in Haribel's eyes spark to life when Pesh mentioned the increased control over emotions gained. Is this true? Haribel asked more energetically than she usually spoke. Yes, but most of the ones that tried it or it was done to died, he answered hesitantly. Haribel noticeably deflated. How many? she asked. Too many to count, he answered. Haribel finally knew where all the hollow that had been rounded up had gone and it wasn't good. Despite how horrible the majority of hollow were Haribel truly cared and felt they had the potential to be better so to hear so many had died was devastating. Hisashi was happy he was able to bring Nell too and her fraction to Haribel since he couldn't really tell what was going on and lost no chase himself despite knowing. How would he explain knowing what was going on in the most guarded place in Hueco Mundo after all? At least now he had managed to create a situation where they could find out naturally. Hisashi patted Haribel on the back to the best of his ability to console her. You can't save everyone Haribel, he said. I know, I gave up on that long ago. It doesn't make it easier though, she said with a deep sigh. That's not the most important part though, Pesh said trying to get back on track. What I meant to say is that Grimjow wouldn't be one of only a few Arankar. There are many of them in Lost No Chase, and once he returns, he might bring many more along with him, he said nervously. Not only that, but Aizen likes collecting powerful hollow to turn into Arankar. If Aizen finds out about your group that had two vast O Lord, he will definitely be interested, and Grimjow would be the least of your worries, he said. We can just kick their ass again. Apache said aggressively. Grimjow was able to match what I think might be your strongest member and he isn't even the strongest of the Arankar in Lost No Chase, Pesh corrected her. Nell too nodded nervously. 
I don't want Hitashi to get hurt again, she said with concern. Hisashi smiled at her. No matter what I'll make sure we survive, he said to reassure her. Do you promise? she asked him sincerely. He hesitated for a moment. This wasn't something he could really guarantee yet. At his current power level, though he was no longer a nobody, there were still far too many powerful beings for him to be able to promise something like that. Yeah. I promise, he finally answered. He didn't want her to worry over something she nor any of them could currently change anyway. And Big Sis is here too. We're all in this together, so you don't have to worry, Harabel chimed in. Hisashi was still adjusting to her being so talkative, well at least compared to her usual self. Your big brother had already promised to protect us all after all, Sun Sun said playfully. We can run too. Big brother is very good at endless chase. Nell too said excitedly. We are cowards. Mila Rose said uncharacteristically aggressive. Nell too ran behind Hisashi again. As sorry, Mila Rose said ashamed in a quiet voice. So what else can you tell us? Haribel asked them. Pesh and Dondo Chaka looked at Nell too for a moment. We don't know too much beyond that, when we were still in Lost No Chase we weren't part of leadership so we only know a little about everything going on there. We also haven't been in Lost No Chase for a few months so it's been a while too, Pesh said. If they have a way to get stronger and control our impulses even more should we join? Haribel asked unsurely. Lost No Chase isn't a safe place to stay, we ended up leading over infighting. Though some of the leaders try to crack down on the worst of it, it isn't a high priority. Most of them are still hollow, after all even after becoming Arankar it can only change so much, Pesh elaborated. No one seemed to know what the best course of action was. Hisashi was unsure as to what to do. He didn't really want to get close to Aizen. Also as they were currently Nell too and her fraction definitely couldn't return to Lost No Chase since Neutra would just finish the job. And Canon Haribel and her fraction should already have been part of Lost No Chase, but due to them meeting him that seemed to have been derailed too. If he joined Aizen he would be closer to the Hogyoku, but he would also become known to Aizen which would be dangerous. Also he wasn't sure if he could become an Arankar before completing the mission or would have to absolutely hold off until he got the Hogyoku or risk failing the mission and losing out on the reward. He was fairly certain they would insist on trying to make him an Arankar if he joined which meant if the situation was the latter that would be choosing failure. Chapter 67 Troubled Thoughts Though having them use the Hogyoku on him would provide an opening to steal it, stealing it right in front of them would be a terrible thing to do. If he just took it there was no way he was powerful enough to escape from the entirety of Lost No Chase currently. If he instead tried to fuse with it right away who knew how long the process would take and how vulnerable he would be throughout the process so that option was out too. Then there was also the concern he might be forced to watch the release of Aizen's Zampakudo. This would leave him permanently hypnotized and unable to trust any of his senses which was unacceptable. There was a possibility he would be protected by the system the same way it protected his mind during the holification process. That wasn't guaranteed though and when it did that it came at a massive cost that he couldn't afford again. He was sure even if the system could protect his mind in the same way protecting it from Aizen's release would be far more costly than protecting it through the holification process. An entirely different question was whether he should get Haribel and the Trace Bestias to join Lost No Chase like they were originally meant to. He assumed they would succeed in becoming Arankar if they did since they had in the original timeline, there was no real reason to think that meeting him would throw that off. However, he wasn't thrilled with the risk. On top of that by now he trusted them to keep him a secret, but that didn't mean Aizen wouldn't manage to find out somehow through interacting with them. Nell too and her fraction wouldn't be able to return to Lost No Chase in their current state either since her fraction was one of the weakest if not the weakest in all of Lost No Chase. The only reason they managed to survive and lost no chase was that while Neliel was at her full power she could protect them. With her current injured state and amnesia there is no way Neutra wouldn't take the time to bully and eventually eradicate all of them. Not only Neutra, but there were plenty of other Arankar that would also kick someone while they were down due to the envy they had while Neliel was a high-ranking Espada. He really wanted more time to prepare, but he knew he was running out of time. 
Even if time moved differently here it was still progressing and he had left for Hueco Mundo right as Ichigo left for Soul Society. That whole Soul Society ordeal took only about a month and even with the time dilation he had already been here for a long time. He had made great progress even managing to become a Vasto Lord. It was an amazing feat considering he had only become a hollow around two decades before. Something that generally required centuries, not decades. He was powerful enough to resist even an Arankar like Grimjow as a Vasto Lord despite being cornered due to the situation and not being able to showcase all of his trump cards. However it was still not enough to resist the entire force of Las Noches and Aizen. Not even if he worked together with Haribel, the Trace Bestias, Nell II and her fraction. Even with all nine of them together they would just be a somewhat powerful force. They could run away to Earth, but that would slow their growth to a crawl. That was just him though, as the Trace Bestias, still being a Juchas, would actually lose power if they didn't consume enough. On Earth there wouldn't be enough ambient spirit particles to absorb for them to maintain their strength. It would require inflicting mass genocide on the human population to maintain the current growth. Neither he nor any of the girls would be keen on that. It would also instantly draw the attention of the Shinigami and every other supernatural force which they couldn't afford either. Their little group was relatively powerful being comprised of two Vasto Lord, three Arankar, and three Ajuchas. Maybe comparable to a group like the Visard. However, even the Visor, despite being one of the more powerful groups, were skulking around hiding from Soul Society and Aizen rather than living a relaxing life where they could do as they please. As a group of Hollow, they would be in an even worse situation than the Visor. Finally, Nell too broke Hisashi out of his thoughts. Yeah, there are some real bullies there, she said, crossing her arms with a serious frown. It wasn't very convincing with the snot bubble hanging from her little button nose. Hisashi couldn't help but smile at her antics. Although part of him originally approached Nell too with ulterior motives to gain a powerful ally down the line when she finally regained her original power. She had quickly grown on him over the few weeks they had traveled together. When she returned after calling his allies despite fearing Grimjow he couldn't help by open his heart to the little troublemaker. Though not quite to the level of Haribel, Apache, Sun Sun, and Mila Rose she was quickly becoming a larger priority for him. He hadn't grown quite as close to her fraction yet. Though they were slowly changing due to not being naive like Nell too was they had been a lot more guarded with Hisashi. He had been able to see the wariness in them that had remained until when he had blocked Grimjow's attack on Nell too putting himself at risk for her sake. After we were kicked out of Las Noches we wandered around the surface of Hueco Mundo. We might have been weak in Las Noches, but we are still more powerful than almost all regular hollow so we just avoided the stronger Arankar, Pesh said with some pride. Do you know if they're aware of us? Haribel asked worriedly. Chapter 68 Going Out Together Pesh was unsure how much he should reveal since before Neutra attacked Nell too she was one of the leaders in Las Noches, but now she had amnesia from the head injury he inflicted on her. If it had been before she would be the one with most of the information regarding Las Noches, but now it was left to Pesh and Dondo Chaka. Being mere fraction meant the information they had regarding the workings in Las Noches, limited just to what Neliel had been able to share with them. They hadn't even told Nell too any of it in fear she might recover her memories and traumatizing her in her current childish state preferring to simply entertain her and let her enjoy a happier life without worries. They knew she hadn't been happy when she was in Espada. She didn't fit in with Lost No Chase, she didn't like fighting nor devouring other hollow. It was very similar to how Haribel's group didn't fit in in Hueco Mundo. Most hollow were ruled by their emotions and instincts that trended towards the destructive or tyrannical. Either they consumed each other or they ruled by the law of a jungle. Something that didn't come natural to Neliel. Hisashi didn't say anything since it wasn't his place to share their private details if they weren't comfortable sharing them yet. He could still use his knowledge in guiding them as best he could. Probably? We weren't among the higher-ups so we weren't privy to much information, but we know about Haribel due to her interactions with Berrigan. I've never heard of the rest of you nor this location though. That doesn't mean they aren't aware of them, though. Pesh finally answered. Well, it is only a matter of time. 
Grim Zhao's pride will probably prevent him from reaching out to anyone except his subordinates for his hunt of me, but that can only last so long before either he spills the beans or someone else finds out about his behavior, Hisashi said. The rest could only nod in agreement. Most of them didn't know him at all, really only Pesh and Dondo Chaka knew him at all, but all of them could tell Grim Zhao wasn't going to just give up with this little setback. At least not from what little that they had seen of him. Regardless of what ends up happening, we're going to need to get more powerful. As we are now, we are just scurrying like rats, Hisashi said. Just because you're weak, doesn't mean we are. Apache said stubbornly. Hisashi shot her a look. This wasn't the time for their usual banter. Apache looked surprised before looking away embarrassed. Sorry. She mumbled in response. Sun Sun patted Apache on the shoulder with her tail. It's okay, Apache, she said, knowing Apache was just trying to lighten the mood. Harabel looked troubled, not liking the direction the conversation was going in. We can't. She started. We have to. Hisashi said hesitantly. He didn't want to have an argument with Harabel right when she had started to open up to him more, but they didn't have the luxury. No, we've been trying to so hard. Harabel responded stubbornly. You don't have to Harabel if you don't want to as you're already a vast lord and wouldn't experience much growth. However Apache, Sung Sun and Mila Rose still have room for growth. The same goes for me even as a vast lord, Hisashi said. As they currently are they would be sitting ducks in front of Arankar like Grimjow, he continued. Aye. Harabel hesitated. She had senses the pressure given off by Grimjow while in his resurrection, and it was terrifying. She knew she would be lucky to survive an encounter with him. As for her friends, they wouldn't even last a moment if someone like that attacked them. She was torn between her concern for her loved ones and her feelings regarding the hunting of her fellow Hollow. I agree, Mila Rose said confidently. She was the one with the strongest hunting instincts among their group her form coming from a lioness. She also wasn't entirely happy how Hisashi had passed her by in the short amount of time they had known him. Despite being the quiet one out of the trace bestias, she was even more competitive than Apache. If Hisashi says so, I'll trust him, Sun Sun said, actually being serious for once. Hisashi smiled at her causing her to look away in embarrassment which was an even rarer sight. It seemed unlike her usual teasing and banter she could actually be embarrassed when forced to share her true feelings. I'll agree with whatever Harabel Sama decides, Apache said, still unable to listen to Hisashi she left the final decision to Harabel. Seeing two of her subordinates agree Harabel became even more troubled. Feeling her distress Hisashi patted her on the back. You don't need to participate, just protect them in case something they can't handle appears, he reassured her. It seemed that finally did the trick as she nodded with some resignation. Do we have to? Nell too asked with a sad expression. You don't have to. You're already an Arankar, so consuming some regular hollow isn't going to increase your strength in such a short time. We can all play together between our hunts, Hisashi told her. He was wondering if it would speed up her recovery, but he wasn't going to force her against her will while she was in her little girl form. He didn't have the heart to put her through that knowing how against fighting she was. Since I won't be joining the hunts either we can play together, Harabel said trying to cheer her up. Hisashi felt like it wasn't only to cheer Nell 2 up though. Nell 2 finally smiled again. Pesh and Dondo Chaka seemed to be in agreement too. Hisashi used the entirety of his massive spirit power reserve to infuse spiritual energy absorption in all three of the Trace Bestias. It should help enhance both their passive absorption of ambient spirit particles and also when they consume other hollow. His hope was that he could manage to force them to break through the shackles they hadn't been able to in the original story by giving them a big edge. The original wasn't very clear on what exactly set apart those that could become Vasto Lord and those that couldn't with some speculation being that it was all determined when someone first became a hollow with some simply having a potential to become Vasto Lord that others didn't. It could also be that a hollow had to go through a very specific experience to become a vast o lord such as gaining a better understanding related to their aspect of death. He was going to give simply boosting their spirit power growth beyond anything other hollow could achieve a try. Maybe overstuffing them could do the trick. 
At a certain point quantity could become a quality of its own. They headed back out into Hueco Mundo to hunt together for the first time. Chapter 69 Punishment Training Back on Earth, August 17th, Hey Reina. What's up? Masaki said. Just calling to check up with you. Reina responded. Oh! Well, nothing too much going on here, Masaki said. There were some metallic clashing sounds in the background. Are you sure? Reina asked. Absolutely, Masaki said. So what are you really calling about, dear? Masaki, she responded, cutting to the chase. Do you remember I mentioned I was feeling like I was being watched lately? Reina asked. Yeah. Are you telling me you've got yourself a little stalker? Masaki teased. I don't know. The feeling of being watched has grown stronger and more frequent. It feels a little unsettling. Was just hoping talking with you would set my mind at ease some, Reina responded. You know. If you're worried I can get someone to look into it, Masaki said. If she nagged her husband he could probably get someone to check into it. Speaking of didn't Kasuk still owe her a favor? Then again Hisashi might not be happy about Kasuk being around his sister. He seemed to have avoided meeting anyone so far. She felt he worried too much sometimes. I, uh, no I'm sure it's fine. I don't want to bother you, Reina said hesitantly. Masaki sighed. She loved the girl, but one of her major flaws was that she struggled with asking for and accepting the help of others. Always worrying about whether she was a burden to those around her. There were some more metallic clashing sounds and a pain grunt. What's that sound? I'm not disturbing you, am I? Reina asked curiously. Oh, just my son's punish him, training, Masaki answered. Did you just say punishment? Reina asked incredulously. No. I would never do that to my dear little boy, Masaki answered with a kind smile. Reina would almost have been convinced if it weren't followed by the sounds of explosions moments later. Masaki was once again in Kasuk's basement. This time she wasn't the only one visiting though as she had brought along Ichigo and Ishida Yuryu for training. She had originally planned on bringing Ichigo alone, but when she found out about Ishida being Ishida Ryukin's son and had inherited the Quincy powers she felt some level of responsibility for him. At first Ichigo had been so excited when his mom said she was going to train him. He now knew she had combat experience and unlike with the assholes that were Kasuk and Yuruchi he thought for once he would get to enjoy some normal training. That couldn't be farther from the truth though as his usually sweet mother turned into the worst drill sergeant. He wanted the sweet loving mother from his memories back. Not this demon that had returned from the depths of hell. He hadn't realized how much of a mama's boy he was back then which had biased his memories. He almost cried. Masaki was in her nictic form and using Harenkiaku to stand on the air while firing down spirit power arrows on Ichigo and Ishida. She was talking on an old-school clamshell mobile phone with Reina casually. She was surprised with how good the signal was down here, must have been Kasuk's work. Auntie. I'm really grateful for your help, but isn't this a little too much? Ishida tried to make his case. Masaki, who had been relaxed up until that point, suddenly sprouted a vein on her forehead. Auntie, she mumbled indignantly. The rain of arrows coming from her suddenly sped up, causing both boys to dodge awkwardly to the best of their ability. Unfortunately, they weren't able to dodge all of them. Masaki wasn't too evil, though, and was holding back to the point where the hits didn't cause any serious injuries, feeling more like being hit with a BB gun. Very painful, but mostly harmless. Just don't shoot your eye out. Are they okay? Reina questioned hesitantly after hearing various pain cries. They are doing just fine. They just need some more education, Masaki said in a chilling voice. This is all your fault. Ichigo yelled at Ishida. I'm sorry Mrs. Kurosaki. Ishida yelled. Oh? And what are you apologizing for Ishida-chan? Masaki asked innocently. I shouldn't have called big sister auntie, he said unsurely. Kasuk was off to the side sitting in a beach chair lazily fanning his face while chuckling at their antics. 
Sitting on top of his green and white bucket hat was a black cat lazing away along with him. She has become quite powerful, the cat said in a deep voice. Yeah, I still can't believe it. I would really like to run some further tests on her. Almost as much as I would love to meet this secret hollow benefactor of hers, Kasuk said with a conspiratorial smile. Were you able to find out more? The cat asked curiously. No, beyond what she shared the first time she has been quite tight-lipped regarding it. I haven't been able to pry much more out of her despite my best attempts. The rest of her family doesn't seem to know much more either. The only link we know of is this Reina girl, he responded sadly. I could go take a closer look at her. Stealth is kind of my strong suit. You'll owe me one though. Another one. The cat offered lazily. Maybe. Wait, didn't you owe me one? He asked. Don't even try. The cat said threatening with a clawed paw. Kasuk raised his hands and surrender. I give. I give, he said. He tipped his hat disturbing the cat who jumped down beside him. It might indeed be worth checking though, you never know, he said. I can't believe you took him to our old hangout in Siri IDI while you were all in Soul Society. The good times we shared there, just the two of us, Kasuk joked. Stop making shit up old man, you always like to play with yourself, the cat retorted. Chapter 70, It's in the Air Still on Earth the punishment slash training had been going on for a while with Masaki casually sending showers of arrows down and the two boys dodging them, mostly training their movement techniques. If you were being more sadistic you could consider it training their endurance and resilience too. She was happy to punish them while improving their ability to dodge and run away from danger. She would much rather have her son running away from danger rather than running into it like he had been doing so recklessly ever since he became a Shinigami. They had already been training for a while when the hatchway up in the ceiling of Kasuk's basement was opened up by a tall and muscular tan man with cornrows and a handlebar mustache. It was Tez Saitsukabashi, one of Kasuk's shop employees. He lead in another tan mountain of a man, or rather boy, sporting wavy brown hair that comes down over his left eye. It was Ichigo's friend and ally Sato Yasutora, but was often just called Chad instead. Following them was finally someone of normal height. A cute teenage girl with long burnt orange hair. She might not have been a mountain like the two men, but she had two mountains of her own. Her name was in no way Oraheim, another friend and ally of Ichigo's. Also ostensibly Ichigo's love interest, but it required a few more life and death situations for that to fully bloom. Speaking of those mountains, there was an oddly happy-looking lion plushy wedged between them held in her arms. It almost looked like it was rubbing its face into them lewdly. Following after them a small shy black-haired girl and a short brash red-haired boy simply jumped down from the hatch despite the huge drop. Yururu and Jinta. Kasuk's two other employees that helped run the Yurahara shop along with Tessai. Wah! Wow. Ichigo is so amazing, Oriheim mumbled watching the punishment they two boys were enduring at the hands of Masaki. Chad in the meantime nodded in approval. On the surface he looked quite neutral, but there was a spark of excitement in his eye. Deep down he was fired up and really wanted to join in on the training. Most of them were chatting amongst themselves as they watched Ichigo and Ishida's training. The only exception was Tessai who was his usual stoic self. At this point Masaki even started cackling like a villain as she continued to pelt Ichigo and Ishida. She seemed to be enjoying it all just a little too much. TT time out. Ichigo yelled out in panic as multiple arrows were hitting him all over. He was exhausted and it was starting to catch up with him. After getting in a few more shots Masaki finally came down from the air landing beside them gently while dismissing her transformation. Both Ichigo and Ishida were left splayed on the ground covered in bruises and dirt gasping for a breath. Masaki hadn't gone easy on them which was evident by the fact that even their faces had bruises on them. We could only hope that was the most sensitive spot she didn't hesitate to target for both of them. That was great! Oraheim told them excitedly. Such a good girl, my son is so lucky to have you as a friend, Masaki told her. The plush lion tried to jump in Masaki's bosom to greet her, 
but was nonchalantly slapped aside by her sending him hurtling across the rocky ground. Oraheim blushed, her eyes darting to Ichigo shyly. I'm the lucky one, she mutters. Masaki hugged the shy girl. Kaya! She is just the cutest. Masaki exclaimed excitedly, fawning over the heavily blushing Oraheim. Mom, quit it! You're bothering her, Ichigo said. What? No, I'm not, Masaki said indignantly. Aye, it's fine, Oriheim said. See! Masaki exclaimed with a bright smile. So much better than my delinquent son. Want to be my daughter-in-law? You'd be a good influence on him, Masaki said. It seemed this had broken the usually energetic Oraheim. Aye, aye, aye. She managed to get out. Stop embarrassing her, Ichigo said, now sporting a light blush himself. Oh, whatever happened to that other girl? Tatsuki-chan? You are so cute together, Masaki suddenly asked. Mom, I was five. Ichigo answered in embarrassment. That doesn't answer my question, she responded. Ichigo massaged his brow in frustration. Tatsuki-chan is actually still in our class, she is my best friend, Oraheim said happily finally finding a topic she would much rather talk about, much to Ichigo's frustration. So, so, which one of you is going to be my daughter-in-law? Masaki asked curiously stepping over way too many boundaries. Eh? I, um. Oraheim couldn't form an answer. Stop teasing her mom. Ichigo said once again trying to correct his mom. I feel like you haven't had enough, training. She told him with a serious look causing him to sweat. No. I wasn't saying anything, he said giving up and abandoning Oraheim to his mom. Eh. Ichigo? Oraheim questioned in a panic. Oh my, should I plan the wedding? Kasuk joined in on the teasing hiding his smile behind his fan. Eh stop. Oraheim muttered shyly. Ichigo trying not to be involved anymore walked over to Chad instead giving him a fist bump. What's up? he asked Chad. Good. Chad simply said. Ever the man with a way with words. What about you two? Ichigo asked Jinta and Yururu. Yururu simply blushed without saying anything. Jinta on the other hand aggressively told him to mind his own business. Ichigo thought he had finally escaped when he heard his mom. Don't think we won't be here again tomorrow, she warned him. She might have acted like it was all fun and she was just punishing him, but she trusted Hisashi's words. Hisashi had warned her that things were going to get a lot more troublesome after all and so she was actually working hard to whip her son in the best shape possible in preparation. No amount of complaints was going to stop her. Chapter 71 The Hunt Back in Hueco Mundo Hisashi had been hunting together with the everyone for months and months now. Though Haribel, Nell too, Pesh, Dondo Chaka and Bawa Bawa were along for the ride the only ones actually hunting hollow were Hisashi, Apache, Sung Sun and Mila Rose. Bawa Bawa was at least convenient as a form of transport between hunting grounds. The growth from consuming hollow below the vast O'Lord and Erinkar level just wasn't worth it for those at those levels. The only exception was Hisashi who had his system making the consumption process much more efficient and also granting him experience on top of that allowing him to still benefit from hunting weaker prey. Their followers didn't mind though as Haribel had seemed to really take to doting on Nell too just like Hisashi had. She liked to play all sorts of games with them and Hisashi regularly introduced new games with her that they could play to keep her entertained during their downtime between hunts. Besides that what she loved most was riding on Hisashi's shoulders when he dashed around at high speed like he was some kind of roller coaster ride. Pesh and Dondo Chaka were just happy so long as Nell too was happy and currently she was happier than they had seen her in quite a while so they gladly followed along with the group. They also stuck close to protect her from any danger. Mila Rose was actually the one that took to it the most. Probably some kind of subconscious effect of her form being a lion because she definitely had the hunting instinct. She seemed to always be excited to hunt and actually enjoyed hunting together as if they were some kind of pack. She even opened up more to him once they started hunting. Only a little though. 
she was still the quietest member of the Trace Bestias. Though Apache and Sun Sun were still motivated, even more so with the threat brewing in Las Noches looming over them they just couldn't compete with the passion Mila Rose had for it. Hisashi was making sure to infuse them with spiritual energy absorption whenever it started running low on them so they could absorb as much spiritual energy as possible. Thankfully as a passive skill it was one of the skills that actually cost less of his spirit power to infuse than his active ones making it possible for all three of the girls to have it running around the clock. As for his own progress. Notification Summary Plus 4, 556, 370 XP from Hollow Plus 223, 300 Spirit Power from Hollow Plus 205, 436 Spirit Power from Spiritual Energy Absorption Plus 18 Levels Plus 18 Stat Points Status Panel Name, Saito Hisashi Soul Age, 58 Race, Hollow Rank, Vasto Lord. Level, 212 to 230. XP, 108,630 out of 265,650. Stats. Strength, 325. Dexterity, 633. Constitution, 150. Intelligence, 250. Spirit Power, 2,620,205 to 3,048,941. Available stat points, 0 to 18. Passive skills. Spiritual energy absorption. Ultra speed regeneration. Acidic touch. Silencioso. Active skills. Soul body separation. Spirit power concealment. Illusory aura. Blood. Energy Blade Transcribe Hachijio Sogai Siro Cumin Negation Skill Infusion Sonido Maybe it was his nerve about having to face Aizen, but he pumped all of his free stat points into dexterity. Running was good. Running faster was better. Unfortunately, he couldn't outrun the speed of light. At least not yet. Dexterity, 633 to 651. Available stat points, 18 to 0. His stat growth had slowed down drastically as levels were becoming harder to come by and a single stat point meant a lot less to him now after every transformation had multiplied his existing stat points to insane levels. He would take whatever he could get and his spirit power was still growing significantly making up the bulk of his growth now. They were currently hunting a small group of ajuchas. Between him and the Trace Bestias, it wasn't hard to take them down. There were either no or virtually no other Vasto Lord lurking around Hueco Mundo, so the only concern was running into Erencar from Las Noches, but anything else they ran into didn't stand much of a chance even to Asashi alone, let alone all four of them. This batch belonged to Mila Rose, so after they had defeated them, Mila Rose quickly got to work on devouring them. Even though their bodies lasted longer in Hueco Mundo than they did on Earth the time was still limited. Their corpses would lose energy and slowly dissipate. Hisashi's best guess was that without a valid container spirit particles wanted to equalize just like entropy. Once a soul died it was no longer capable of holding onto the spirit particles. Just like with entropy this meant that Hueco Mundo's high spirit particle density severely slowed down the dissipation process that spread out the spirit particles. The denser the ambient spirit particles were the slower the process. Even Hueco Mundo and Soul Society's higher densities of spirit particles couldn't completely stop the process though so every moment wasted not consuming them was energy lost to the environment. Before Mila Rose managed to finish the last one though she suddenly paused. I feel strange, she said unsurely. Hisashi immediately turned to her curiously. What's it like, he asked her. Like I'm full and about to explode, she answered unsurely. In that case congratulations should be in order, he told her. She seemed excited from the way her ears and tail were moving. It seemed the rest had noticed their strange behavior and came over to check. Are you okay, Rose? Harabel asked her with concern. I think so, Mila Rose said. She should be ready, Hisashi said. Harabel nodded seriously. What? 
Apache shouted. She seemed upset. It wasn't surprising since all three of them could be quite competitive with each other. Mila Rose and Apache were definitely the most competitive out of the three of them though. We should find a place before she does. I can use my barrier to suppress the effects. It would help to be out of sight so I can set it up, Hisashi said interrupting Apache before she could start something. Chapter 72 Good Kitty It didn't take them too long to find a small abandoned cave in the Hueco Mundo wasteland. They all rushed in as soon as they determined it was empty. It would be more than enough to obscure them from sight. Given that Mila Rose was already struggling to hold back her evolution Hisashi quickly deployed a Hachijio Sogai barrier and infused Mila Rose with spirit power concealment. The two together should take care of most or possibly all of the commotion and prevent them from being discovered. He wasn't sure how violent other hollows vast o lord transformations since he had only ever witnessed his own. Since he was just about the least normal hollow around he wasn't a very good standard for what to expect. By the time they got her Mila Rose fell to her knees unable to support her own weight, her spirit pressure was fluctuating wildly barely managing to remain under her control. When she finally stopped trying it burst forth like a waterfall trying to drown out those present. Hisashi made sure to shield Apache and Sung Sun, the only two that could actually get harmed by her spirit pressure during the transformation. Dondo Chaka had already swallowed Bawa Bawa into his stomach to protect him. Everyone else was at a level where it was nothing more than a breeze to them. The surrounding spirit particles started surging towards Mila Rose like a wild torrent as her body devoured it like an endless pit. Apache and Sun Sun were surprised though. Hisashi was the only person they had witnessed becoming a vast o lord and it had been a much more violent affair to the point it had destroyed the environment where he transformed. Though the surge Mila Rose was causing was still wild it was nowhere near that powerful. Nell too crawled up on Hisashi's should and smiled clapping her hands. She's doing it, she yelled happily. Hisashi smiled back at her. It was hard to tell with the spirit particle density becoming so dense they were visible and obscuring their sight, but Mila Rose's form was shifting slowly from her lion form towards a humanoid stature. At the end of the transformation the spirit particle dissipated revealing Mila Rose's new form. She had a human-like body, but her arms and legs still ended in massive lion paws that seemed to be a mix of a real paw and some kind of gauntlet. Looking up at her face she still had a lion's head surrounded by a wild mane. It had become a little more feminine looking than the one she had in her ajucha's form though. A tail swung playfully behind her back. The rest of her was similar to the large tan form she had as an errand car. Hisashi gulped. She had also gained her notoriously impressive assets. Tai Kubo really knew his busty girls. She breathed in a deep breath and exhaled it slowly to calm down before opening her eyes. She clenched her paws to get a feel for her somewhat more human form. Going from a completely animal-like form to a more humanoid one would probably take a while to get used to, but from the wide grin on her muzzle it was obvious she was excited about her newfound power. She was now strong enough to face Apache and Sung Sun together and beat them like they were children. They were best friends, but for once being the strongest among them definitely stroked her pride. The only thing that saddened her was that after assessing her spirit power and comparing it to what she experienced from Isashi during his transformation she already knew she was the weakest vast o lord in their group. Hisashi would come in first, followed by Haribel, and then herself. She didn't compare herself to Nell's group. For one comparing with Erenkar through direct spiritual power level comparisons was a waste of time since that was only a small part of what made Erenkar stronger than regular Hollow. Their improved control, Zampakudo, and new abilities meant the only true way to compare was to engage them in a serious fight. Nell too herself meanwhile wasn't even considered since everyone saw her more as a little sister in need of protection. The only ones aware of Nell too's true power being her fraction members and Hisashi. Apache was an entirely different story as she looked very frustrated. What's up with this bullshit? I worked so hard. Arg! Apache yelled. She couldn't accept Mila Rose was the first of them that succeeded, deep down she knew she could have worked even harder like Mila Rose had and blamed herself for losing. Ah, cute little Apache. Do you need some pets? Hisashi teased her. 
You shut up. Just watch me, she retorted immediately, in no mood for his teasing. Sung Sun seemed the least bothered out of them, but it was hard to say since she had a tendency to hide her true feelings behind a mask of casual indifference. Harabelle looked positively proud. She did treat the Trace Bestias like friends or even family, after all. Good job, Rose, she told her which caused Mila Rose's tail to flick excitedly. Pesh and Dondo Chaka looked rather nervous. They were only a Juches class errand car and it was quite likely Mila Rose had just surpassed them when she became a Vasto Lord. They had just been bumped down the hierarchy one more step. They were kind of used to being around the bottom from their time in Los No Chase. At least so far their new group didn't seem to treat them badly due to this. Sure. Mila Rose did great. Let's get moving, Apache said impatiently. She seemed fired up. Mila Rose beating her to the punch had really lit a fire under her. She wouldn't accept falling any further behind. She rushed out first with the others needing to chase after her. Hisashi smiled at the change in her. This would only make it more likely she would succeed. Chapter 73 Catching Up Apache seemed like she was possessed by a devil. She refused to remain as an Ajuchas when Mila Rose had managed to become a Vasto Lord. Harabel didn't count since she was already a Vasto Lord and their de facto leader. She could kind of look the other way for Hisashi since he had always been a weird hollow and wasn't one of her sisters. Mila Rose was a different story as the three of them had always been Ajuchas together. She started hunting relentlessly and now that Mila Rose was no longer participating in their hunt she was getting a larger portion of their hunts. Nell too had really managed to get closer to everyone. Hisashi had been easy as he knew her from the original story and knew she was a good trustworthy person deep down. Harabelle was easy to win over too as she seemed to show an almost maternal care for Nell too which always brought a smile to his face. It was an entirely different side to her than he was used to seeing. Eventually though even the more hesitant Trace Bestias who had started out a bit more wary of Nell too and her fraction had opened their non-existent hearts to the little girl over the months spent together. This was awkward for Pesh and Dondo Chaka who were torn. On the one hand they wanted Nell too to be as safe and happy as she could be. On the other they were more than a little sour because they felt they were slowly being replaced as her favorites by Hisashi and Haribo. They didn't dare to consider that maybe they already had been. As if that wasn't enough though now she was also getting closer to the three other girls. The brotherhood was fearing the sisterhood. The hunt went on for a lot longer than Apache wanted, but she wasn't deterred. She was determined to catch back up to Mila Rose. Sun Sun seemed less concerned at least in comparison to Apache. However given the amount of effort she was putting in despite her usual lazy behavior indicated she wasn't entirely unaffected. Unlike the Misashi was used to the grind. It had been his life ever since he became a hollow. He knew if he took too long his family would be dead before he even got a chance to return to a human-like form so taking it easy had never been an option. Also unlike other Ajuchas he still had a human perception of time. Where most Ajuchas were hundreds of years old and lazing around for a few months or even years was seen as merely a short break to others Hisashi felt like he had taken a long break if he took it easy for just a few weeks. He was sure eventually as he aged he would experience similar feelings regarding the passage of time but now it allowed him to make the most of things since he was still trying to improve on a human timescale. It was one of the small benefits he still had due to how fast he had managed to become a Vasto Lord. Whether it was sheer force of will or the increased amount of prey going towards Apache she had finally managed it. The experience was quite similar with the main difference being the final results of the transformations. She had taken on human form, though covered mostly in brown fur. Her legs still ended in hoofs just like Mila Rose had kept her lion's feet. However her hands had actually turned human. She also now seemed to have a human head, but was wearing a deer skull over the top of her head with only her lower jaw being revealed from under it. The antlers had become quite a bit larger and more ornate compared to when she was in Ajuchas though. They were more reminiscent of her resurrection rather than Ajuchas form. She had also become rather short. Both her and Mila Rose hadn't been too dissimilar in size as Ajuchas, but Mila Rose turned into an Amazon during her transformation, whereas Apache. 
Hisashi looked at Apache's petite form. It seemed despite becoming a vast O Lord this time around before becoming an Arankar some things were probably not meant to change. What? Apache yelled aggressively stomping her feet. It seemed she had senses something and felt insulted. Hisashi chuckled. Nothing, he said. You bastard. Get over here. We're the same now. I'll show you, she yelled. Don't judge our little Apache, Sun Sun said supporting her. Why, you? Apache said and gnashed her teeth. And now we can hunt together, just the two of us, Sun Sun teased Hisashi. Apache rolled her eyes. You do deserve each other, she grumbled. Nell too gently patted her on the leg to reassure her. There, there, she said. Nell too knew what it was like to be short. Hisashi gasped exaggeratedly. You want me all to yourself? He responded. You know I could just eat you up, she said playing along. Both of them broke out in chuckles. Harabelle sighed. Can't you all behave? She asked. But that wouldn't be as fun, Sung Sun answered. Hisashi shrugged. He knew Harabelle wasn't being serious either. It had become easier to read her since she started opening up. My time has finally come. Hisashi. Fight me! I'm going to win this time. Apache yelled confidently. It seemed her new form had already gone to her head. Hisashi just shook his head. Okay, if that's what you want, he said already knowing what the end result would be. She wouldn't accept it until after he beat her up a little though. Apache ran out ahead of him excited to try out her new power. Don't go too hard on her, Haribel said with some concern. Apache was the only one that believed she stood a chance. Chapter 74 Friendly Spar Apache looked excited about each chance at some revenge for all his teasing. Normally she would only argue back since he was so much more powerful, but for once she felt like she could exact a little revenge physically to teach him a lesson about bullying her. She got into a fighting stance that looked like a mix between something an animal would take and what a human would. She wasn't used to her new human form after all. Hisashi smiled. Her behavior was kind of cute to him. Like when a little kitten acts like a ferocious beast. The fact that it can't harm you just makes it cuter even if they are serious about it. Even her frown was kind of cute. He stood opposite her, but didn't take a battle stance. So what are we doing? Hisashi asked her playfully. Take this seriously. If you don't I'll make sure you regret it, she yelled back. To humor her he spread his forearms to cover for attacks from any direction. Seeing him take at least some form of stance took some of the edge off her aggression, her eyes were still brimming with determination though. Okay, start I guess, Sun Sun said. Could you be a little more serious about this? Apache asked her in annoyance. She didn't dwell on it any further and immediately dashed towards Hisashi as fast as she could. Unfortunately for her speed was Hisashi's strongest suit. Even the fast Grimjow that was already an Aaron car wasn't quite as fast as him after unleashing his resurrection. How could she even dream to compete? She seemed positively slow to his perception. He blocked a wild kick, making sure to use the side of his blade to avoid harming her. As soon as she noticed this though she only raged harder, following up with a flurry of kicks and punches that he continued to block in a similar manner. He probably could have faked it some for her pleasure, but he didn't particularly enjoy lying to those close to him and despite their constant arguments she was still one of the few people close to him in this world. He attacked back a few times to keep her on her toes, but made sure to hold back on both the strength and speed to the point she would be just barely able to handle it making it some good training for her. Noticing what he was doing she looked even more pissed off. Don't you dare look down on me, she growled. She started circling him trying to watch for an attack openings, but every time she thought she had found one he seemed to intercept it like it had been the plan all along. Rah! It's not fair, she complained. Giving up already? Hisashi asked with a teasing murk. Never, she retorted and went right back to attacking him. Her anger only made her more predictable and easy to counter though. Are you even trying? He said continuing to tease her to egg her on. 
It seemed he unintentionally flipped a switch in Apache. She yelled out in rage and Asiro gradually formed between her horns before firing off directly at him. He swung two of his blades coated in energy blade, splitting the Asiro into four with each piece barely slipping past him cutting deep trenches in the ground around him. Apache thought she finally got him, but when her Asiro faded away she found him standing unharmed among the destruction. She clicked her tongue in frustration. Wah! Show amazing. I want to go bam and gra too. Nell too yelled out from the side where everyone was watching their little duel. Harabelle was holding onto her to prevent her from joining with a bitter smile. Let's just watch for now. Hisashi is playing with Apache right now. Later you can have your own turn, okay? She said trying to appease the little girl. Muo! But they look like they're having fun. I want to play too. Nell too said with a pout still doing her best to struggle and escape Harabelle's grasp. Nell Sama, she is right you should probably wait your turn, Dondo Chaka said joining Harabelle's side to try and convince the little girl. Don't you want Hisashi to spend time with just you instead of sharing with Apache? If you wait until Apache is done you can have him all to yourself, Pesh argued. I guess. Nell too finally relented. Harabelle nodded finally letting her go, but keeping a close eye on her. She was really worrying too much though as Apache wasn't capable of seriously hurting the girl and Isashi had enough control to ensure he didn't. Nell too climbed up Dondo Chaka finding a place to sit on top of his head while cheering on Isashi. Apache didn't give up and started using a very basic form of sonido that she now had access to after gaining a mostly human form. She used this to form more Ciro from various places including to overwhelm him. Unfortunately the same happened as he simply danced between the blasts and severed those he couldn't dodge. Apache was already panting. Shit, she muttered. Are you even trying? Sun Sun yelled to tease Apache. Apache just ignored her keeping her focus on Hisashi instead. She realized she was just wasting her stamina trying to run around with Sonido and firing off Ciro left and right. She went back to a more direct confrontation and dashed back into melee range. Her sonido was still very sloppy though despite her best efforts to adjust to her new more humanoid form allowing Hisashi to easily dodge her attacks. He felt like teasing her some since she had become so confident she could take revenge on him and just like he had done when he first became a vast o lord he used the opportunity every time he dodged to spank her now human ass. Something that quickly sent her even deeper into a rage. You bastard. Get over here, damn it, she yelled in frustration. Chapter 75 How Embarrassing She really becomes predictable with that temper of her, doesn't she? Sun Sun said. Harabelle sighed. Yeah, she will have to learn at some point, she agreed. But, she did get a lot stronger due to the transformation. I wonder if I can succeed, Sun Sun wondered sounding a little less confident than her usual self. Since both Mila Rose and Apache were able to do it I'm sure you can too, Harabelle did her best to reassure her. I believe in you big sis, Nell too joined in trying to cheer Sun Sun up. Thank you little one, Sun Sun said. She sounded more like herself again. Before you know it, you'll be pretty just like big sis Harabelle, she responded. She thought for a moment before breaking into a wide smile. Maybe then he will let you ride him too, just like me. Riding him is the best. Nell too added innocently. Harabelle blushed a little at Nell too's innocent comments. What? You don't think I'm already beautiful enough? Sun Sun teased. Nell too seemed to be thinking hard. Big Brother Hitachi doesn't look at you the way he looks at Big Sis Harabelle when he thinks no one is looking, she said eventually. Harabelle's blush grew even deeper. She lightly coughed to get their attention. Their spar seems to be nearing the end, she said to divert the conversation. Oh? Don't you want to hear more about this interesting topic, Harabella say, Ma? Sun Sun teased. Harabelle kept her eyes focused on the spar as if she didn't care, but she couldn't hide the light blush that remained on her cheeks. No. I'm just interested in how Apache will react once she realizes she can't even make him serious, she answered trying to keep her voice as neutral as she could. 
Sung Sun rolled her eyes dramatically, but stopped teasing her leader. Apache was standing across from Isashi panting heavily, her stance on the verge of breaking from exhaustion. Despite the exhaustion she was completely pristine aside from some light dirt. In the entire spar Hisashi hadn't attacked her even once yet. His calm expression despite all her effort just pissed her off to no end. It was only a minor thing compared to the fact that she couldn't even force him to attack her when she was going all out though. She had hoped by finally achieving Vasto Lord she would be able to push him a little. Of course she wasn't stupid enough to actually think she would win, but the final result was still depressing. Her behind was also starting to turn rather sore. She wouldn't admit to that being a reason for giving up though. Whatever, you win this time, she finally begrudgingly admitted. She immediately walked away joining their little audience. Nell too finally took her chance to jump off Dondochak and ran to Isashi, climbing up his shoulder. That was amazing. I want to play too though, she said excitedly. Hisashi smiled. Thanks. What game do you want to play? He asked. I want to play Endless Chase again, you have to carry me and go real fast though, she said. Sure. If I'm not the one chasing you who is going to chase us? He asked her. Nell too giggled mirthfully. All of them, because we're too fast, she said. I'm sure we can convince them to and if we can't Haribel definitely can, he said. Though Haribel could be cold and distant to most she tended to spoil Nell too. Nell too pulled his hair as if to spur him on towards the others. Let's go, she announced. Hisashi rolled his eyes, but followed her directions. Did she think he was some kind of horse? He thought to himself. Speaking of horses. He thought, glancing at the still annoyed Apache who was venting to Mila Rose. Haribel Sama was really into your spar, Sun Sun joked to Isashi. Before she could continue though Haribel shut her down with a sharp glare. Nell too jumped down and ran up to Haribel in a hurry which caused her to stop glaring. What's that mischievous look for? Haribel asked Nell too playfully. I convinced Brother Hitashi to play, she said proudly. Haribel chuckled. Did you now? she said. Yeah, but I want to play Endless Chase. I want Hitashi to carry me, but then he can't chase me, she said looking troubled. Well I could chase you, Haribel offered. Nell too had a glint in her eye, things were going just the way she wanted them to. Big sis Haribel is the best, she said. I though you just said I was the best? Hisashi asked with a playful smirk. Nell too hesitated for a moment. Uh, you're both the best, she finally said. Sun Sun chuckled lightly. Oh, how fickle. How about I join too, she said. Even more is even better. Nell too said happily. Me too, Mila Rose quietly added with a slight smile. Apache grumbled a little, still annoyed due to her entirely one-sided loss. I guess I can join too, she eventually conceded. Nell too tilted her head cutely looking at Pesh and Dondo Chaka. What about you? she asked. They couldn't resist the puppy dog eyes. Of course Nell Sama, the both vociferously agreed instantly. With a wide smile she quickly climbed up onto Isashi's shoulder again. Ready. Set. And. Go, she yelled. Hisashi took off like a speeding train while the others tried to keep up with him. Nell too couldn't stop giggling. Faster. Faster. I almost peed, she said. Hisashi chuckled. You don't ever get tired of this, do you? He asked her. No. I'm a real masochist, she announced. Even being aware of her vocabulary, Hisashi still had to do his best to keep a straight face. Sure you are, Nell. Sure you are. He reassured her. He wondered how embarrassed her adult form would be. That's how a group containing some of the most powerful hollow in all of Hueco Mundo ended up running around in a game of endless chase while looking for their next hunt. Chapter 76 Disappointment Despite her best efforts over months of hunting Sung Sun hadn't succeeded in becoming a Vasto Lord. She had just consumed another Ajuchas, but still nothing happened. Sun Sun's tail slammed into the ground hard. 
why can't I evolve, she said with frustration. It's okay, Sung Sun, you'll be able to soon enough, Haribel tried to reassure her. Mila Rose put a hand on Sung Sun's back as a show of support. It's been months and nothing. Sung Sun yelled. There was none of her usual coy and playful attitude. It seemed she was hitting her limit. Nell too climbed up on Sung Sun's head. I believe in you. Just keep trying, she told Sung Sun. Sung Sun sighed. Even the child was trying to reassure her. Unfortunately, this feeling just made the situation worse rather than better. She wondered about how pathetic was she being. She couldn't force herself to just get over it, though. Maybe we should take a little break to calm down. We have been pushing ourselves for a few months now, after all. Taking our minds off it for a while might actually be a good thing, Hisashi offered. Sun Sun just gave a listless nod. Okay, let's do that, Haribel agreed. Nell too smiled. Yay, then we can play even more, she shouted in excitement. Hisashi shook his head with a smile. Nothing seemed to phase the ever-positive Nell Tuesday. She always tried to find the positive in any situation even if it was just being able to play games with her friends. It was bittersweet sometimes. Watching her and playing with her sometimes reminded him of when his sister was still little, which in turn reminded him of how much time he had missed with her. How much time he was currently missing with her. At least a lot less time had passed for Reyna than had for him. He hadn't been able to see her for over two years now even if only a couple of weeks had passed from her perspective. He shouldn't dwell too much on such thoughts. They didn't help any after all and he was doing his best to improve things. He was already getting so close now that he was a vast o lord. They managed to make it back to the hideout after a few more weeks and instead of focusing on getting Sung Sun to evolve they let her relax for a while instead. Only Hisashi was still going out to hunt closer by to maintain his continued growth. He did take more time off to spend with everyone else and sometimes Nell too came along with him to play while he hunted. Apache still regularly challenged him to spars. She still wasn't satisfied with any of their outcomes, but she kept trying regardless of the outcomes. She was determined to beat him someday. A day he knew would never come due to his broken abilities and system. Currently even if she became an errand car she would be lucky to tie with him, let alone win and he was still growing faster than her now that she had become a vast o lord. Mila Rose had returned to her lazier self as soon as she became a vast o lord. Although she enjoyed hunting she enjoyed lazing about more. Now that the pressure of both growing and the worry of losing progress were gone she really decided to enjoy her time. Hisashi had taken the extra time he had to think about his options and had finally managed to figure out an option that could help him. His major fear of even being around Aizen was the fear of getting hypnotized. Sure Aizen was pretty powerful and skilled at Kido, but those were honestly nowhere near as scary as the possibility of no longer being able to trust anything your senses are telling you, now that was downright terrifying. The epiphany he had was the thought of using his illusory aura not against others, but turning it against himself to prevent him from seeing Aizen Zampakudo making it impossible for him to be hypnotized. Sure it would make it a little harder to fight Aizen if he couldn't see his sword, but it was a small price to pay to be completely impervious to his hypnotism. Better yet if Aizen did try to use his Zampakudo on him it would likely lead to him lowering his guard at least a little thinking he could control him through his Zampakudo's ability. He couldn't go looking for Aizen though. If he wanted Aizen to lower his guard as much as he could the other thing he would need was for Aizen or at least lost no chase to reach out to him rather than the other way around. He couldn't have Aizen thinking he wanted to join them without being invited first. That only left two worries though. First whether he would be forced to transform into an Arankar upon joining and whether that would fail the mission, he suspected it probably wouldn't since the mission didn't mention it, but he couldn't recall the system ever outright mentioning a failure condition beyond them being implied by the description of the mission. It was a risk he just might need to take if he wanted to get close to the Hogyoku. The other worry was Nell Tuesday. She currently wouldn't be able to return to Lost No Chase as her and her fraction were simply too weak as they were now, he also wouldn't want to leave her to fend for herself now even if they were relatively powerful compared to any regular hollow. He had grown quite fond of the girl over the many months they spent together. Protecting her, playing games with her. 
even her fraction had grown on him a little, just a little though. In the middle of his train of thought he was interrupted by his system. New mission, Heal Neliel to Odell Schwank. Neliel to Odell Schwank was attacked by Neutrit Yilgut damaging her hollow mask transforming her into her current child form, sealing her power and memories in the process. Heal the damage to her mask to regain a powerful ally. Reward, Skill, Karen Zanjutsu. That's the end of this tale for now. Thank you for watching and I'll see you in part 5. Peace.